United States is involved across the world. Our government imposes its rigid view of the world in Vietnam, in the Dominican Republic, elsewhere. The politicians who make decisions for us are too removed from us. More and more we go unrepresented. The words they use to justify themselves have lost a tangible meaning. The government turns more impatiently against those who do not accept its views. The United States turns, not with decency, not with a mind open to the many different ways people have of seeking solutions. Who does our government speak for? In other countries, who are the leaders our government talks to and treats with now? The few who control the lives of those beneath them. But there are others our government will be obliged to deal with. Venezuela, a sea of oil, controlled by American companies. If the profits from the oil reached down to them, the eight and a half million people would live differently. But the profits leave. Creole is standard oil of New Jersey. To control oil is to control the country. The wealthy float on the surface. Living a certain way affects how you see and feel. Limits the range of what you can understand. Do they know very much about what is below the surface? Slums, hunger are in sight. One lives beside them. One stops seeing them. They must live around their countrymen, these other human beings. The wealthy have to fight free from the central experience of their country, live always in a small circle. Their position becomes more precarious. It is more hollow, more unreal, more disconnected. For them, nothing ever changes. How much of their own lives do they determine? They live, they work, as they have to. Dictator Perez Jimenez served the circle who control Venezuela's economy. Here, an imposed system keeps people from the power that allows people to begin, to grow. Men have no land, no say in how they will work the land. Men have no say in what they will eat. Three percent of the people own 90 percent of the land, fertile land, enough to feed everyone. But food is imported and prices rise. Eggs come from Florida, corn from Iowa. The peasants leave. One out of three remains in the countryside. But jobs do not exist. Men have no say in how they live. People try to escape. The city swells up the rim of hills. Go, try Caracas. 14% unemployed. Population soars from 150,000 to 2 million. Here, the cost of living is two times that of New York City. The city bulges and spreads out. Perez Jimenez embezzled 250 million payment for loyalty to our oil companies and to Venezuela's ruling class. The estate of Governor Rockefeller. Presidente Perez Jimenez also had a tasteful, proud estate. And two, Perez Jimenez was awarded the United States Order of Merit generously presented by President Eisenhower. His secret police reigned while its head was an intimate of our ambassador. In order to get along in Venezuela, it is not sufficient for well-meaning men to make an honest living from their work, thus isolating themselves from the surrounding corruption. No, it is necessary to stay in the good graces of the government to pamper the governors and the incompetents who have already arrived on top establish a reign of ineptitude over ability. Bronze medals, self-obsession, the jealous guardians of power. An economic downswing, unemployment increased. 
the cost of living rose higher. There was a general strike. Mass demonstrations grew. Students took the lead. On 23rd January 1958, before dawn, President Perez Jimenez fled, first to the Dominican Republic in Trujillo, then to Miami. The demonstrations continued during the 23rd. 300 students were killed by the secret police. The dictator is overthrown. They feel 10 years of his power washed away. Perez Jimenez had not allowed organized unions. He shut down newspapers. Universities were often closed to discourage opposition. One of his laws read, the military authorities shall repress drastically an affront against persons or property. People ask, will the land be given to peasants? Will there be employment, houses to live in? Will the necessary changes begin? All through the country, the revolution unlocked people. People flooded the streets, drawn out, ignited by the possibility. People celebrating, hoping, people springing forward, people held on a leash too long. People toyed with and forgotten and held back and treated like things. The unfathomable wild energies, destruction, hope. They go to release the political prisoners. Shut away, abused for what one believes, the deep moral isolation remains unbroken, except perhaps in quiet conversations with a friend. Families broken, hands, bodies broken. I could hear the one being tortured scream. We all heard his scream. Men learn to live inside themselves. Where there are political prisoners, there are many locked away who dared nothing. Innocence, whom someone whispered about or pointed at. Now they hunt out the secret police. The arm of the dictator must be broken. His legacy of stupid bestiality. In these first days, the rank and file of the army are close with the people. They fight together. The high command of the army is split. But they agree that they don't want this to go too far. Still, they do not dare to try to stop the people, yet. The secret police make the last stand of the regime. They think, at the time, that they have the most to lose. They do not realize they'll be employed soon again. They evoke a fury. For the people, they are the agents of El Presidente's oppression. Their power was the power no man should have. And then, for the first time during the revolution, soldiers are at odds with the crowds. Still, people mass around the headquarters of the secret police. The army holds them back as they have before, as they will again, soon. An agent is caught, a victim. The rage of 10 years. 150 dead in this small battle. Political prisoners slaughtered in their cells. Headquarters of the secret police. Files, records, names, control over daily lives. A primitive knife, the Holy Mother. How many died in these cells? And then, the faces of the secret police. Sometimes less than one expects, those strangely vacant daily faces, a little prosperous, a little afraid. Expendable technicians. How deep was the revolution? What had it been for? What was wanted? A government junta was formed. There were four colonels, all from the Perez Jimenez army. At its head was Admiral Wolfgang Larrazabal. They met in the high chambers with their Spanish colonial feel, with the encrusted carved ceilings. Land, work, education. They spoke as among old friends an intimate circle. The people? This talk in the room among old friends, isolated talk, disconnected talk. And the people? Unity around the new government junta. 
all call for unity around this junta that represents the same ruling circles, the same ones who had used Perez Jimenez. Those in exile could come home again. More fortunate than the political prisoners, they had been able to continue writing, speaking, planning for this day. Machado, leader of the Communist Party, he too supports the new junta and joins the call for unity. What had they done all these years? Living off plans. It is one thing to give up one's country voluntarily. Caldera, leader of the Christian Democrats, he too calls for unity. They return. Others too closely associated with Perez Jimenez go into exile. They have been allowed to leave. They simply pass those who are coming back. For this officer, so much has changed that he must leave. The revolution has reworked his whole world. But for others, the vast number, nothing at all has changed. All is just as it was, just as it will be. And more return each with his picture of what has happened, of what must happen now. The leaders whose profession, whose life this is, now they are not just talking in a distant room. Now they must begin to alter Venezuela, if they can. Romulo Betancourt, ex-communist, former president, violent opponent of Perez Jimenez. He too calls for unity. In exile, he seemed a radical. Betancourt is the leader of Acción Democrática, traditional party of the democratic left. As he campaigns for president, many think his election would be the culmination of this revolution, a triumph for reformist democracy. Acción Democrática, Betancourt, a test whether the necessary reforms can be made under capitalism in an underdeveloped country. In the elections of 58, Betancourt wins with 49% of the vote. A politician announces a program and some people listen. The educated, others in politics, weigh what is new in the speech. They argue over the nuances. Down here, how many hear the speech? How many could read it if they had a newspaper? They have a simple way of judging what has been done here. They continue trying to lead their lives. Where are their changes in their day-to-day -day lives? They continue and they wait. So few even imagine that this is not the only way men have to live. Betancourt passed an agrarian reform law. Almost 90,000 land titles were given away. Years after, 2,000 new owners actually worked their land. No loans for seed or fertilizer, no roads into the land, no equipment. Often, the peasant was not even told where the land was, a paper title that was never honored. I sold the government 2,000 hectares for the reform. It was my worst land. I couldn't work it, even with machinery. But I got a better price for that land than my best land could bring me in the open market. There's a dozen families working on it now. They'll go bankrupt in less than two years, and I'll buy the land back at 10%. With the road they themselves have had to build. A land reform law is on paper. Between this paper and peasants is a vast distance. The bureaucracy cannot bridge the gap. The government cannot implement its policies. No one speaks for the people. They are voiceless. They are told to wait. A close friend who drafted the land reform law left Betancourt's party and went into opposition. Finally, I realized nothing was being done. My law, our law, has become a farce. I am against violence. I am anti-communist and anti-Castro. When my men occupy the land by force, I tell them to give it back, to wait. 
But how long will they wait? How long can they wait? Vice President Nixon comes to Venezuela. How long can they wait? Until the small part of them that can still hope is enlarged. Things get worse, not better. From the first, Betancourt was unable to devote himself to his reforms. To stay in power, he had to make sacrifices. He had to rely increasingly on United States investments, on his own military, on the ruling interests. They oblige him to go slow. His program disintegrates. He comes to rely on those same men who had sustained Perez Jimenez. He cannot, or will not, create new centers of power based on the people. Betancourt moves steadily, ineluctably, to the right. Caracas, 16% unemployed, and the government can do nothing. A terrible shortage of houses. The government can barely begin. The United States oil companies boom. Money does not come into these streets. Attacks against Betancourt intensified, and then even his own party split over his reactionary direction. The young go to form the movement of the revolutionary left, the MIR. Older men go into less radical opposition. Soon, Betancourt suppresses the Communist Party and the MIR. Here, it goes on. Where does it go? Where does it go? This street is quiet during the shutting down of opposition newspapers, the fury against students, the start of a terror worse than those before. Arrests go on around them. Their houses are searched. They do not remain apart. The government tries to crush the people who would change their lives. Meeting resistance, the government terror intensified. Agents from the Jimenez days ran the secret police, Digapol. Sotopol, an elite goon squad, roamed the streets. Venezuela was in a state of siege. Romulo, to the wall, the assassin. Opposition to the government was driven underground. The suppression tended to unite them. Terror made revolutionaries out of many who had hoped for peaceful change through the ballot. Reform from within the system was proving impossible. In 1962, after the uprisings of Carupano and Puerto Cabello, the Armed Forces of National Liberation, the FALN, was formed to coordinate armed struggle. Comandante Elias Manuit of the FALN, Chief of Staff of the Guerrilla Front in Falcón. By now, all who dream about elections should have realized that in this country nothing is solved by elections. Because an individual who is not a revolutionary and obtains political power will not change the country's political, economic and social situation. Just because this cannot be solved by a change of individuals, but simply by a change of systems. And the change of system cannot be brought about in this country except with the weapons in our hands. Publications suppressed, leaders jailed, parties outlawed. What other alternatives remain for the people? One of my sons identifies with leftist parties in spite of the beliefs, convictions and traditions of the family. My son was taken prisoner during the recent revolt. He was held naked in a cell to this was added primitive savage torture. He was submitted to head donkings in water and later upon regaining consciousness, 
The procedure was repeated. For the hunted activists, for the ordinary man, Betancourt's government was a military dictatorship. Resistance mounted in the city, in the backlands. Soon, the armed forces of national liberation chose to strengthen rural guerrilla fronts. They began to prepare for a long campaign. Actions continue in the city. The FALN guerrillas entrenched themselves. This was the start. Before the birth of the FALN, political alternatives were polarized between the liberal democracy that Betancourt represented and the conservative Communist Party. Both were equally separated from the conditions and needs of the people of Venezuela. But Castro's Sierra Maestra campaign was an example of another way. There, a small band began to build an island a new society within the unproductive body of a stagnant society. They defended it with arms. Contact was made with the people and the movement swelled. Their success, the accomplishments of the revolution, provided inspiration throughout Latin America. It revealed the limitations of many of the older leaders. In Venezuela, this kind of revolution is beginning. A new generation of revolutionaries make up the FALN. Students, army officers, workers, professors, peasants, a senator. Inexperienced, various, flexible. Now they are in close touch with the actual basis of life in their country. Their movement can grow and deepen and retain its relevance to the life around them. And this new life also changes them. At first, they sabotaged to call attention to the state of things in their country. They thought in terms of imminent insurrection. But they realized that victory was not that close. Now, they stress strategic rural action. Organizing continues in unions, factories, slums, within the army rank and file. But all aims at strengthening this armed struggle in the countryside. The FALN began to build itself into the countryside to gradually increase its territories of operations. In Miranda State, in Falcón, in Lara, Portuguesa, and Trujillo. Four separate fronts with extensive peasant support. Of these guerrillas, most had never known anything but city life, university life before. Their politics were limited by their experience. Peasants, the former military, sons of the wealthy, workers, all lived together. The gifts, the information, the differences mingle. The girl cleaning her submachine gun was a student. Comandante Olga's acts during the years of sabotage, her escape from prison, are famous. They begin to establish ways different from the society around them. The FALN grows. The society outside stiffens against all dissent. In 1964, there were 1,500 political prisoners in the government jails. They live and work in groups of four and five. The squads are arranged widely in concentric circles around the headquarters. They gain the confidence of the peasants. Without their cooperation and friendship, the guerrillas could not survive. They remain responsive to the peasants. In Lara, for example, we represent sanitation, education, government. We have open schools, we are for the sick. We have formed civil institutions of power, which are, in fact, organs of government. Venezuelan armies, led by members of the U.S. military mission in Caracas, have failed to dislodge the guerrillas. They have failed also in attempts to win the peasants' support. The government approached the peasants in the same way the Spaniards approached the Indians, with trinkets and necklaces exchanging those things for iron, for petroleum, for everything we have. At first the peasants are surprised. They wonder about all this sudden love. But then they finally realize that all the love came to them because of the guerrillas in the mountains. When we weren't there, well, nothing. Cavities rotted their teeth, they died of hunger, of malaria. 
Now they are given things. And they realize, because our peasant is intelligent, that the rulers are trying to drive the guerrilla movement out. On cold nights, we have smoked glocky strikes. We have eaten concentrated foods, and our women compañeras have even put all those funny trinkets. The peasant take those gifts and offer them to us and tell us what is happening. The enemy has realized that these methods fail. Now, instead of coming with a little present, they come in with a the machete. They whip them. They torture them. So, in fact, one man in the presence of the rest of the inhabitants of the village was hung by his testicles to instill fear in all the people of the village. And then, after torturing him savagely, they tried to use him as a guide. And that peasant, knowing full well where we were, led them elsewhere. Not even by force could they use him. All the methods have failed them. All those methods they have brought from Vietnam have failed them. It is rare for a hard-pressed peasant to be generous with his food. Once, the guerrillas stopped a truck that was passing through the village. They told the peasants to unload the truck and to take the food and to keep it. Then they sent the truck away. They gather wild rice before returning to the camp. Now, after two years, they are largely self-sufficient. They live off the land. The peasants supply them with much. They draw together a band of brothers knitted together by their common opposition, their sense of what they are working toward by the way of life they now share. They have begun to hammer out a new set of relations among themselves. They have begun in many ways. In the face of total repression, the FALN has shown a remarkable ability to sustain itself. The FALN is organizing patiently. It is prepared for a long struggle. Its roots have already gone down deep and again, Manwid. Therefore, I admire then the decision of all those revolutionaries who are starting their liberation. I respect the opinion of some leaders of some countries who are trying to gain power by pacific means. I respect their opinion. But at the same time, and you will excuse me, I am obliged to say that they will not be able to stabilize themselves in power by those means. The armed forces of national liberation assume that as they draw close to victory, the United States will send troops against them to defend American interests. We have interests elsewhere in Latin America, and elsewhere there are revolutionary movements. Hugo Blanco in Peru, Jan Sosa in Guatemala, others in Colombia. Will we intervene everywhere? Our present policies suggest that we will.